We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, you can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Great. It's been, uh, well, I was about to say it's been a long time, but it, it certainly hasn't been a long time. Welcome back, mate. How's it going? It's going well. It's going well. Um, I think for everyone listening or watching, uh, we had some Wi-Fi trouble last time, didn't we? My uh, editor, uh, Alvin, thank you so much, mate. I think you did really well at cutting it out to make it look pretty seamless, but it was an interesting podcast. (laughs) Well, let's see how today goes. I think it'll go well. There's just, there's so much that we touched on last time that, uh, you know, I I didn't really get a chance to ask you about, but we we got through the first book. I was wondering if you could give everyone a run through of the second book. So I was looking up, um, I was looking it up recently. It looks really interesting. Okay. So the the second book, which came out uh, earlier this year, just as the pandemic was kicking off, uh, is called the Cosmic Revolutionaries Handbook or How to Beat the Big Bang. And uh, again, it's uh, co-authored with Luke Barnes at uh, Western Sydney University. And uh, we're both cosmologists, so we study the universe and the evolution of the universe, and we give lots of public talks on, uh, you know, how, how cosmology works. And at the end of the talks, of course, it, there's, uh, you get questions from the audience. Questions from kids are always great, mm. but there's always somebody in the audience, normally an older gentleman. They're normally male. Uh, normally, <laughs> normally an, an engineer. They have some sort of mathematical background, et cetera. And they just don't like it. Mm. They don't like the description of the universe that we, we have these days. They don't like the notion that of the universe is born in a big bang. They don't like the notion that we have expanding space, all this kind of stuff. And so, uh, and we also get letters off these guys. And uh, it was quite frequently, they said, uh, they often, basically, the letter is along the lines of, uh, you guys are idiots, you're all deluded, but this is the truth. This is the way the universe really works. So we, we get this quite a lot. And you know, we, we sort of get this question, why do we believe, and believe in air quotes, right? Why do we believe this really strange picture of the universe that we keep telling people? They don't like dark matter. They don't like dark energy. They don't like all this kind of stuff. So, it's interesting. Yeah, so we, we decided to basically try and address this from the viewpoint of if you imagine that you did have an alternative, that you had an idea that you think really did describe the way the universe works, then what you need to do to convince scientists to actually take you seriously. Mm. And so what we sort of do is we try and build up the observational evidence, because that, that's vitally important in science, of course. So we talk about the key bits of um, observation. Things like the, the night sky being dark is, is a key piece of uh, information we have to use inside our theories. Mm. And we talk about the bar that has to be met to be on par with the current cosmological ideas that we have today. Mm-hmm. And we, we point out as we go along, um, which observations have slain alternatives in the past. So people have proposed universes that were static and unchanging and have been around forever. And you can, you can get rid of those very easy. The, the fact that the night sky is dark is one that tells you that can't be correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there's other things like um, um, Fred Hoyle's Steady State Universe, and the, yep. there's a, something called the Electric Universe, where mm-hmm. every, the, no gravity, everything's powered by electricity, etc. So, so we build up this picture through the book on what you need to do to overthrow the Big Bang. It just seems really strange that people would be upset with that because it sounds to me like science is so so against morality, you know, what is right and wrong. Uh, you know, we went over this in our, in our show two weeks ago. We were talking about the dichotomy of, of mm-hmm. you know, what is and what ought to be, you know. Um, for people to have, to be upset at what you have objectively measured seems very bizarre to me. 
So, so there's, there's a couple of things. Firstly, there's a philosophical objection, right? Okay. So, they, so, so they, I, I'm going to choose my words very carefully. Here, right? <laughs> Come on, go right. <laughs> uh, but but, but you, you, you know this. There are people that object to things that they don't understand. Yeah. They don't understand it, therefore it can't be correct. Yes. Right? And, of course, the entire mathematics of cosmology is all wrapped up in Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is notoriously mathematically difficult, mm, et cetera. Mm. Uh, so they, 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 don't, they, don't, um, they don't understand it, so therefore they don't like it. But also what we mm. discovered is that they don't actually understand the process of science. I think that some of them maybe uh, imagine that we dream up these ideas after a, a, you know, a, a night at the pub. Mm. You know, if you, what's the craziest idea that we could sell next week? <laughs> yeah. um, and but this and this notion of us collecting observations and constructing our theories and checking that our theories match our observations and throwing away the ones that don't—they haven't actually encountered that process. They, and I, 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 we can we can talk about who to blame in a moment. Yes, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. gonna say you are talking about scientists here, from what I gave. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 yeah. So they don't they don't understand the process of science. So they don't they don't even know that science is about you no know, holding your idea up to the universe, and the universe is the ultimate arbiter. If it doesn't work, you're in the bin. That's it. So, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. That's what that's the kind of story that we're trying to get across. Mm. It just seems so strange because you, you said that the people that don't like it are engineers, so they are scientists. Uh, ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, engineers. Uh, yeah. Now, I said that. I said that, everyone. <laughs> We've got a lot of engineers that listen to the show. So. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, uh, and, and both my, my sons are uh, engineers. My, um, one is doing uh, mechanical engineering, the other is doing uh, computer science and engineering. So well, I have a big fan. I don't like them. <laughs> yeah, I, am a, I am a big fan of, yes, of yes. engineers. But I guess the key point is, is that yes, they have encountered some of these ideas and yes, they have some mathematics, etc. but they haven't gotten their teeth into the, the underlying mathematics that we use in, in our modern day theories. Right. So you know, it might have a, a surface level uh, idea of what's going on. Getting into the depths, you know, requires really digging into a textbook or into a course. That part mm. they haven't done yet. Yeah, see, and see, this is a good point because we, if we abstract this out, uh, I think one of the reasons why I never did well at maths at school was because I'm, I'm, I, uh, I'm always in the realm. I live in the realm of possibility, which is obviously both a good thing and a bad thing, right? So I'm. Um, uh, obsessed with awe and spontaneity and wonder uh, and insights. I love new ways of looking at things. And, uh, and there's a great um, social psychologist who studies morality and he looks at how character traits uh, reflect political leanings. This is that people that are more open to new ideas are obviously going to be a little bit more progressive. People that are open, people that are closed off and like things the way they are. Now, obviously you need both. Uh, uh, are going to be more conservative. So you need that structure and that routine, but it becomes stagnant and tyrannical, politically speaking, if it's not met with the realm of possibility. Yeah. But what I never liked about maths was because, because you couldn't get around, you couldn't think your way out of 2 plus 2 being 4. That's just the way it is, 2 plus 2 equals 4. And I think I'm trying to put myself in um, the people's shoes that perhaps don't like this way of view in the universe is because... Uh, it, when something is, by definition, it can't be anything else. And I think that's very difficult for human beings with this kind of perceptive filter that's laid on us. Yeah, yes, that, that's, that's very true. Uh, you know, at some level, science is, a, is like a court case, right? Yeah. And, it, and it, it, it is evidence versus argument. And, uh, you know... <laughs> If you fail, you, you fail. If you fail to describe what's going on, you fail. And as you say, there's no way out of it other than to come back with a better idea. Mm. And, you know, that's how science sort of progresses. But, yeah, yeah. So, but, the, you know, the pure maths, as you said, it's one of those things that, um, you know, you've set down the ground rules and you can do whatever you want to within those ground rules, but you can't bend them and you definitely can't yeah. break them. Right? Can't so, change the rules. 
Yeah, that's right. That gets me thinking then. So like, so if we, if we, if we, as far as I, and I'm trying to understand this from with, with my way of seeing the world, because I'm so illogical and, uh, and very irrational, it, it sounds to me like Einstein fundamentally set the rules. This is the way the universe, it's, it's a relative universe, space and time are dependent on each other. Uh, is it perhaps time to change the way we're seeing an Einstein universe? So, so you have to remember that, um, so Einstein uh, has set the rules, but they're the current rules. Mm. And any good scientist will say that anything on the theory side, that can go in the bin if something better comes along. So if we have something that can do what Einstein does, plus one, then Einstein mm. goes in the bin, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Now, that uh, picture of Einstein plus one might not look anything like what Einstein actually wrote down. And this is the kind of shift that we had when we went from Newton's f- uh, view of gravity to Einstein's view of gravity. They're very mm. different things. But Newton is at some level subsumed into Einstein. And we expect that there yeah. is a bigger overarching theory, right? That there's this quest for the theory of everything and that Einstein will fit into there somehow, but it might not look anything like the notions that Einstein wrote down. Mm. So, you know, we, uh, um, we, we, we do talk about rules. We do talk about laws, but you know, rules and laws can be replaced, right? So that we, that's the way science really works. Yes. So, so yeah. Cool. So it has this kind of like there's this, this scientific evolution to it. You can't yes. just throw it all out uh, because then you're left with nothing. But you can adapt and bend. And what are some of the what are some of the things that Einstein's theory uh, doesn't amount to? Like what are some of the unknowns? Oh, oh well. It's, so um, I, I mentioned last time I've written another book with uh, yes. this guy Chris Chris Ferry, right? And it's all about this issue that there are two pillars: quantum mechanics relativity, right? So if you want to describe anything involved in gravity, right? So the gravitational field of the earth, the way GPS systems work, the expansion of the universe, the way galaxies do their things, right? You use gravity. So you talk in the language of, of Einstein, Mm. right? But if you want to talk about the very small and you want to talk about protons and neutrons, electrons and atoms down on that scale, gravity isn't important anymore. Down there, it's the electromagnetic force. It's the strong force. It's the weak force. So down there, you talk in the language of quantum mechanics, which is the language that describes those forces. So if I wanted to come along and ask the question, well, what is the influence of gravity on an atom? I don't know how to really to answer that question, mm. right? Because you're pushing into the realm where Quantum mechanics is the play in the leading role, and we don't know how, how it plays with gravity. So it, it, we like to think of it in terms of domains, right? When Einstein works over here, and uh, quantum mechanics works over here, currently there's a fuzzy boundary between them. Some, and some people think that there might be one overarching boundary that will have them all in there. And other people think that maybe they will be separate forever, but we mm. just don't know. Wow. So, and, and do both parties like each other? Do they have a mutual respect for each other? Or? Ooh, respect. That's an interesting word. <laughs> uh, I think everybody appreciates the problem. Everybody understands the problem. But, but it, it, you know, this is a, a quest. It, it's not a quest that occupies the minds of all the, the physicists out there, right? So if you were a physicist, most physicists are, um, they work on materials, right? So designing materials or working with biomedical materials, you don't care really about where, how gravity doesn't play with quantum mechanics. You just want to get your surfaces to do what your surfaces do. Yeah. But if you're going to wonder about the fundamental universe, so this is now pushed into these areas, which people may have heard of, you know, string theory and, yes. and M theory and all that kind of stuff. That's where you really worry about this. And people know that, you know, this is the, the, the wild frontier, right? Here be dragons, but, you know, in physics, places where here be dragons, here also be Nobel Prizes. Yeah. If you can, if you can actually explore that and sort that out. Yes. So, yeah, pe- people are interested, but, you know, uh, on his deathbed, Einstein was working on trying to unite electromagnetism and gravity, and he failed. That was 1955. Mm-hmm. People have been working on it since the 1920s. Here we are now in the 2020s, and we're not that much closer. Really? Wow. It's unbelievable. Uh, 
There, I mean, we, what we've discovered, of course, is we've discovered, uh, I mean, uh, Einstein was doomed to fail at some level because he didn't know about the two nuclear forces, the strong and the weak nuclear forces. Mm -hmm. And so we've been able to make the strong force, the weak force, and electromagnetism, they all sort of sit together quite happily. But gravity just refuses to play ball because it's, it's a mm -hmm. just completely different language. Right? Mm -hmm. Gravity, as you've mentioned, is space and time, and they're interrelated and curved, all this kind of stuff. Quantum mechanics is all this wave functions and probability and all that, that stuff. They're just different languages. And yeah. we, we've got to find the language where they actually, you know, it's the same language. Yeah. And, and I suppose this is where, uh, this is where this kind of new age science meets spirituality stuff comes into it. This is actually a um, conversation that I really wanted to have with you because I think in between us chatting in person and now um, hooking up in 2020, uh, I was, I found out about um, like, oh, what the bleep. You've heard of the documentary, What the Bleep? Yes. Yeah, I'm, yeah, sure, yeah. I'm I, sure you have. <laughs> I, do, I do believe my wife was interviewed for that. I'm not sure if she ended up oh, in there. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah she, she's, she's a Go physicist as well, by the way. So, so yes. it, it wasn't like it was just a random <laughs> woman she's on the street. She's a hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they just thought she had a good opinion. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, look, it, you know, that for, I, I, as far as I can comprehend, I, I believe the idea behind that um, – thoughts uh influencing matter was that idea and you'll be able to explain this far better than i can but this this double double slit experiment where it was only when scientists observed the uh particles at the other end that they actually weren't waves they were particles it's, is it something like that it is um you you you're entering a minefield at the moment, and and um, I love let it. me okay. So let me explain the the minefield. Um, the, so quantum mechanics is this highly successful theory, right? So wow. we can write out the mathematics, and we can do experiments to uh, I can't remember 14, 15 decimal places, make a prediction and test it. You get the right answer. Whoa. Incredibly, incredibly successful, uh, but it's in a language which doesn't really. Um, match our large scale, you know, co common sense experience of the world, mm. right? So on the small scale, as I've mentioned, it's all about wave functions and probability and uncertainty, which is, you know, the, not what we experience here. So the mathematics is beautiful. Then comes, how do I describe that mathematics in terms of an interpretation? I want to explain to you what the mathematics are doing. And nobody can agree on one single description that satisfies everybody. Mm. Uh, and the, so the, as you mentioned, there's this one uh, description, which is called the Copenhagen interpretation. Yes. Uh, because that used to be a hotbed of quantum mechanics back in, back in the day. Mm. Uh, and that is, is that the, you describe the, the microscopic world in terms of wave functions, which are waves of probability. But when you make a measurement, that measurement is precise, right? So if you imagine that we're talking about, um, we could talk about an electron, but let's talk about a, a pool table because everybody loves pool, right? Yes. So, so you could imagine that uh, if nobody's looking at the pool table, but the, you have no idea where the pool ball is. And so there's some sort of wavy function, which is the probability of where the ball is. But as soon as you turn around, the ball is just there. You can see it. That's exactly what it is. Yes. So the, so there, it, so in one interpretation, there's a mechanism involved called collapse in the wave function, right? Yes. Whereby the the it goes from being something which is uncertain and spread out to being specifically in one place. And this is the idea that in what the bleep that they are using. And part of the problem is, is the observation is not rigorously defined by this picture, right? It's a picture. I've, mm. I've just drawn a picture. Mm. So to some people, observation means a human looked at it, right? Mm. Other people say, well, why a human? What about a chimpanzee? Mm. Right? If a chimpanzee looks at it, I mean, a chimpanzee would know where a billiard ball is. Yeah. What about a, what about a dog? Okay. <laughs> and you, you can work your way down because there are some people that want to somehow attach um, quantum mechanics to consciousness yes that, and that, that, that's sort of tied together 
Now, so that, but that's just one interpretation of the mathematics. And there are others. There are others which are even funkier mm. than the notion of, um, uh, of this wave function that collapses. So there's, uh, uh, this is going to be slightly long-winded. I hope you don't mind. No, I love it. I just love hearing you talk. It's great. <laughs> so there, there's a, there was a physicist. Uh, his name was Hugh Everett III. And I think this is back in the 1950s and 60s. And he, he's got a couple of claims to fame. What, number one is uh, he is the father of the guitarist in the Eels. I believe that's oh, correct. Right? And number two is he came up with a new interpretation of quantum mechanics called the many worlds hypothesis. Whoa. And the many worlds hypothesis is, um, let, let's, let's make the picture somewhat simpler, right? So let's just say that there are two locations you could have your pool ball, yes. either on the right side or the left side. And of course, your wave function with a little bit of probability on the right, a little bit of probability on the left, when you turn around, collapse the wave functions. It is on the right or it is on the left. Yeah. In Hugh Everett's picture, as you turn around and the observation doesn't collapse the wave function, but actually splits the universe in two. Mm. And so the universe branches off. In one branch of the universe, the ball is on the right. One branch of the universe, the ball is on the left. Right? And this happens for all observations. And observation here goes all the way down to things interacting, all kinds of things. That the universe is constantly split in. These probabilities... Like, uh, what was that movie? Was it Revolving Door? Oh, um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's with Gwyneth yeah. Paltrow. Gwyneth Paltrow, yeah. yeah. You know, a, a, a decision, a, a, a different decision leads off to a completely different place. Yeah. And yeah. So, so this notion that all of the potential histories of the universe have been and are being played out all the time, all Whoa. the time the universe is split in. And you might go, that's, you might go, that's mad, absolutely mad. But it's discussed and philosophers love it. And it is, an, again, another one of those interpretations of quantum mm. mechanics. And in fact, there's a, a scientist, um, Sean Carroll. I love Sean out, Carroll. Uh, yeah, he, he, he points out that this is actually the, the biggest embarrassment in physics is that we can't come up uh, with a description of quantum mechanics that everyone can agree on. And yeah. people tend to fall into camps, right? Whether you're, you're a, you know, a, a how was it? Copenhagen. 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 Yeah, something like that. Copenhagen. Or, yeah. Or you're a Bohmian. Uh, you follow bone mechanics or, you know, and many worlds. So, so, yeah, quantum mechanics, because of the language that we use to describe the mathematics, it ends up with a lot more um, attachment to mysticism mm -hmm. and, and spiritualism than, say, I know, surface physics. Yes. Right? No, nobody, nobody talks about how atoms are laid down and say, oh, that's got something to do with my consciousness, right? Yes. It's, be it's because of the, lang it's the language of quantum mechanics that makes it... Uh, in fact, I think it was called the... Is it, is it the Tower Physics or the Woo Woo Physics? Is it, oh, it's even a book about Woo -woo this. Physics, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's something that sounds like right. That. Yeah. Where, again, um, uh, it, it's the notion of quantum mechanics. Because it's strange to us as big beings. Therefore, we can apply it to all strange things. Yeah. And, and, and what's his name? Uh, Deepak Chopra? Yes, he loves it. Yeah, he loves it, right? Yes. But then if you, if you sat down with a physicist and asked them to listen to what he said, they just go... They hate it. But, yeah. They hate it. And it comes yeah. back to this idea of uh, absolutes and, and fundamentalism. What I, what I love about true science is that it uh, encourages doubt all the time by definition. Like what you said at the very beginning of this podcast, this is the absolute best we have uh, until something else comes along. You know, the idea mm -hmm. that uh, a scientist and a religious individual could come together if scientists prove the existence of God, it would be the greatest day for science. We, there is a God, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not the idea of well, that's all bullshit. It's uh, because we haven't proven it yet based on what we know about the world. We can't say that's true. You know, there's a great, uh, there's a great, uh, we could say something, go for it. Oh, oh no, no. That, I mean, that's, that's precisely uh, the issue. So, so when somebody comes up to me and says, "We don't have to bring God into it," right? course, they say, you know, "They say, oh, what if, what if our universe is inside an atom in a tear of a giant in another universe?" <laughs> and, and you, do, and you do get these. 
That, that rolled off the tongue so well for, for, <laughs> to make me think that someone has actually said that to you. <laughs> so, so my immediate question is, well, well what, what does that imply? What is the observational test I can do mm -hmm. to say whether or not that's the way the universe works? Mm -hmm. And of course, they haven't thought of their idea beyond that. And then um, when you get to the question of religion and is there a God, then there, of course, there, what, what, are, what are the experiments that I can do? And of course, uh, uh, James Randi, who died recently, yes. right, had, had his million bucks, right? Any, come on, bring a miracle that I can't explain or reproduce and this million bucks is yours. Yes. Uh, yes. And of course, he, he demonstrated essentially that all magicians are charlatans. Right? Yeah, that's I mean, right. that's what it boils down to. But it's a similar thing with the religion side of things. Is that if you give us testable predictions, mm. then, then yes, the two would come together. But of course, that's not the way that religions work. They don't, they don't, they don't work in, um, you know, they don't work in the same kind of, um, nature of the universe side of things that, yeah. that science does. Yeah, it, 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 religion lacks that objectivity and that that measuring. Have, do you know much about uh, uh, William Blake? William Blake, as in eighteen uh, hundreds. Yeah, Blake? that's right. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the pragmatist, the father of pragmatism. Yes. I suppose yeah. what he was doing, he was defining um, um, mysticism and, and spirituality. He was doing lots of other things as well, but. I suppose one thing, because I'm very interested, I love people like William Blake, I love people like Jean Piaget who were trying to reconcile objectivity and subjectivity. And I think we spoke about this on the last episode of the podcast yeah. briefly. I love that idea because I think that both represent, you know, we live in a world of polarisation, not just politically. Um, the world is a, big, is a big paradox and if you lean too far into yin, you're ultimately going to find yourself in yang, you know, that, that idea. And yeah. what I love about consolidating the two is because I think um, when, when scientists and, and religious folk have disagreements is because they're essentially speaking two different languages. And I feel like when, when a, uh, a spiritualist, not necessarily a religious individual, I mean, not to say that religious people aren't spiritual, but religion is a, it's very, very obvious that religion is a man-made institutionalized understanding of you know, subjective intuition and that which we cannot explain, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, when someone comes along to you and says, do you believe God? I mean, obviously the first thing you have to do is define God. Mm -hmm. but if they say to you, God is a, a you know, a, a, an, an internal sense of self of, of a oneness with, with the universe and all that is, you know, all this kind of stuff, they're speaking the language of intuition and, and, a pragmatic knowing, you know, that, that, that is not something that you can uh, measure, you know, necessarily. And it doesn't even matter on, on the definition of God. So my, my point is when we get into absolutist mentalities, do, do you recognize that both camps, not necessarily wrong, look at what science has given us, you know, we, I would not exist. You know, we, we could not be doing this right now without science, but at the same time, this, the, the, the morality that's come from and evolved through religion, all this kind of stuff, they, they, they both have um, fair arguments. Yeah, well, look, uh, I, I am a, I'm a, a John Lennon when it comes to religion, right? I mean, yeah, uh, I, 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 it is, to me, it's whatever gets you through the night, right? right, whatever, right. <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever you need to deal with the world because, you know, Science is not the. It's not there to just deal with every situation you're going to encounter. There are things that go on, and you you need something else. So for me, that that side of things is fine. Mm -hmm. And people have their their internal uh, sense that makes them feel better. Their their internal morals, etc. And I think I think many scientists would agree that that side is fine, right? Uh, but of course, it's the it's the larger scale stuff that yeah. becomes the problem, right? It does. Because and it and as scientists, that's where a lot of the friction uh, mm. comes along, right? Because you you run up against people who the Big Bang theory, right? You know, f f the universe is fourteen billion years old. What what do I do when I meet somebody who says it's six thousand years oh, old? God. And, they, and they they want to, they they, uh, they just are unwilling to have their mind changed, right? Yeah. I mean, so what's the point? What well, I mean, I, I, yeah, exactly, totally. exactly. Yeah, but there's not much you can do. 
But but the, the problem is, of course, is then when they decide that their view has to be put on everybody else. Totally. That, that's when the problem starts. Totally. Absolutely. And I would even argue that science can give you uh, morality. You know, the, the, the idea of exercising doubt, therefore humility, and understanding the unfathomable scale of the universe and how insignificant, therefore gratifying it is to be having an experience knowing that it will end. I suppose my, I've got a book coming out actually in a couple of weeks. Oh. One of the things I was trying to do was, was show, and this isn't me, the Tom Ahern theory. I've just read a whole bunch of books and, um, and love that idea that, you know, because we, we're now conscious enough to, to question whether we need religion and spirituality to be moral beings. And I, I don't think, like science has evolved, like everything evolves, I, I don't think we can come to a place, we could have come to a place where we could question that now without religion and without spirituality. So we've been able to transcend that and perceive that stuff objectively and go, do we still need to believe in those myths for us to be moral? Because now I, now I know what it means to have a moral compass and how to cultivate and exercise it. Um, Go me, you know. I, I live in the 21st century. That's brilliant. Without religion, I, I wonder, you know, if I'd grown up in the 10th century, how primitive I might fall. You know, my urges would I fall back on uh, without that kind of overarching, you know, if, if you're bad, you'll go to hell type stuff. I don't know, but I think I love that idea of morality evolving. You know, uh, I, I, yes, yeah. And look, there, there are there are many things about. Um, Science. So, so one of the areas of science I, I particularly enjoy, and I'm not an expert in, is the entire uh, genetics side of things, mm-hmm. right? And one of the things that I still amazes me is, of course, is that we look around the world and we look at people, and we know the you've got everything from you know, almost jet black skin in Africa to the palest of pale when you get to the poles, etc. And me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, look, I'm pasty European. I. I <laughs> fry up in no time. Um, yeah. um, but the amazing thing is, of course, is that th- that is all so superficial. All of those yeah. changes have occurred over tens of thousands, most a hundred thousand years. And, you know, the, the people that left Africa, uh, we're all just, you know, all the people other than the, the ones who are still in Africa, we're all descended from that small group. So genetically we're, we're so similar. And mm. again, you know, I think before, uh, Darwin came along and realized the first that there was this process of evolution. Um, and now I think with the genetic side, it has become a leveler that to realize that we are, we are all really very similar and the mm. external stuff is, is superficial mm. in comparison. And we just sort of, we, we sort of know this. We, we, I mean, uh, internally we're all virtually identical, right? I mean, you could, you could transplant, uh, organs from a person on this side of the world into a person on that side of the world. We, we're the same being. And so for me, that, that I think has been a very powerful thing. Of course, not, not everybody wants to, um, wants to believe that because of course you, you, some people like feeling that they're better than the other group. Yes. But yeah, it, it is a, uh, for me, I, I really like the idea that we're all that similar. Yeah, totally. And you could even argue, you know, um, people, people of color are having, you know, a tough time. Well, I mean, they've been having a tough time for a while, but it's really kind of bubbling and boiling to the surface now. But from an evolutionary genetic perspective, you could argue with the, the, you know, the rise of climate change, that the, the melanin in their skin, that tone, they're at an advantage now, given what we're doing with some, especially in Australia. You know, I'm not sure yeah. if the ozone layer is still, uh, the whole the ozone is still prevalent. It certainly was when I was growing up. But um, you could definitely argue that they're at an evolutionary advantage relative to pasty folk like us, mate. <laughs> well, well, that's right. I mean, so, but the quick, you know, one of the interesting things is, so there was a big argument in Britain a couple of years ago about, you know, what colour skin did the first Britons have, the first that migrated across Europe? Because, of course, Britain likes to think itself as whiter than white. But probably totally. the people that got there first were kind of, kind of pe- uh, not pale, they're kind of um, darker skinned. Mm. But, you know, oh, they, yeah. probably, they probably lost that melanin relatively quickly. Yeah. And, and so the flip side is 
true too. We could probably evolve back in, you know, I don't know how many generations it takes to do that, but over some time scale, it, it, it was lost quickly. It probably could come back quickly. But again, it, g- genetics is, is, is kind, of, kind of cool. Genetics is a fascinating subject, and this is where you can start talking about um, aliens and you can go into, I mean, I, w- I was going to lead the conversation down um, epigenetics because I find uh, neuroplasticity very interesting. I find epigenetics very interesting because it means you know, we really have a whole lot of power over not only how we perceive the world, but our physiological structure, you know, mm-hmm. um, especially in those formative years, you know, zero to five, all that, all that sort of thing. The reason why I brought aliens up, not just because of your background, <laughs> but um, you, you talk about this, this idea that, uh, that the melanin tone for, for Europeans or for people that weren't in that kind of central equator territory might have changed the fair skin really quickly. Think about how we're living right now. We're sitting down a hell of a lot more, um, all these kinds of things. You look at aliens now and people say these encounters with aliens. Well, their heads are a hell of a lot bigger. We're certainly using more brain function. People would argue we're probably not because our attention span is going down. But uh, height isn't necessarily um, as important as it, as it perhaps was. Um, that kind of like small and, and apparently as well, Asian countries are the, are the countries that are repopulating faster than, you know, European countries. Also. So that, that kind of like alien look, there's that theory that we are perhaps moving. That's the next kind of humanoid prototype. Well, it's a hard one to guess how humans are going to evolve into the future, right? Because what we don't know yet is exactly what the selection pressures on us are going to be, Mm. right? And it all comes down to selection pressures. I actually was listening to a podcast when I was out earlier on today with um, uh, Tim Peake. He's an astronaut in Britain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was talking about living in space and the things that start to happen to you in space. He says things that you don't even think about. And he said one of the things that causes problems uh, is because you are not walking, your feet shed all the thick skin. They don't need it anymore, right? So, Whoa. <laughs> well, and he says that that becomes a problem when you take your socks off because that stuff gets in everywhere. So you have to take your socks off near an air vent to suck in all this. Skin oh, right. my God. Right. And that's just on one space trip. Right. So you can imagine that if we are in space, like for a long period of time, we are going to evolve in a certain way. But if we also then have people on Mars, where the gravity is only a fraction of the gravity on Earth, Mm -hmm. they will evolve a different way because their selection pressures will be different. Mm -hmm. So we, we do not know yet what our selection pressures will be. And that will dictate how we will change. But we are very very malleable kind of creatures, mm-hmm. right? We, we do, um, it's of course not seen on a, on the human civilization timescale with 20,000 years, but a hundred thousand years or 200,000 years, which is, you know, the timescales that we potentially have ahead of us, we could end up with essentially different species of human, um, because of different environments in which we live in. Yeah. And the question is if one met another, would they even really recognize each other? Exactly. Exactly. That's so true. It's so yeah. true. I often thought about that when uh, my dad loves uh, Star Trek. We often oh, yeah. and I was about to say, I often thought about it. I didn't. Now in uh, being an adult, it's, it, I'm thinking about it now. Um, you know, two, th- what is it? The final frontier. What's that kind of, is it two, 300 years from now? Is it roughly? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Or yeah. something like that. You know, in the last 50 years, I think we have um, we have grown in height, I think, by a couple of inches on average or something, males and females relatively or something like that. 200, 300 years, it's, it's a tiny amount of time, but it is still enough to notice some kind of change. And I was, thought it was interesting watching or well, looking back on it now. You watch Star Trek and it seems like humans 300 years from now are exactly the same as humans now. And yet we've just, you know, we've figured out world peace and we're makes all these aliens. And you, you, you have to assume some kind of evolution, even in that short amount of time, would be evident, do you reckon? Uh, well, uh, yes. But again, it's, it's, it, this stuff on, you know, on that t- sort of timescale is relatively slow for us to notice. Right? 300 years is really, you know, four, four or five generations. Yeah, it's right? true. Yeah. Right? You know, from... Well, but, but maybe a bit more than that. But the, the key thing, you're, you're talking about um, height. 
the, the, the growth of humans has come down to nutrition more than every, anything, mm-hmm. right? It's more mm-hmm. people now are getting better food. So, but, you know, as you said, this entire epigenetics thing, if we ensure that the entire human population has better food and we work out how to make even better of foods, yes. um, you know, we will start influencing our own evolution. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, you know, we will start to find in our own selection pressures. And, and that even, uh, you know, this is even before we start thinking of the entire cybernetics and replacing I bits know. when they go wrong, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, who wouldn't? Yeah. At some level, who wouldn't, you know, if your leg goes wrong, replace a leg. And before you know, you, you've replaced more or less everything. Um, you know, I th- all these things are on the cards. And then you, you would be designed for whichever environment you're going to be in. Yes, yes. It's... Uh... Was that a reference to what Elon Musk is doing with the, what's that thing called? He's putting that chip in his. uh, Oh, in the rat's brains. Yeah, it's called something though. Um, It's actually called, oh, people are going to, I've spoken about this on the show before. People are going to message me straight away. Uh, What is it called, Geraint? Uh (laughs) I can't think of it. Uh, Neuralink, Neuralink. Thank God. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Neuralink. And, you know, he he set that up to be like, oh, you know, we're going to have chips in our brains, all that sort of thing. The idea behind that is to get parts of the brain that weren't talking to each other, talking to each other again to, to cure paraplegia, quadriplegia, you know, an incredible idea. And when you take it further to that, um, you know, how can we use genetics and, and, and change with technology to help the species? You can, you can already think about how, you know, how different we might look one of the things that's come straight to my mind is um, women's hips because women have had to, you know, not women, but females over the course of evolution have had to make such a sacrifice um, to give birth now. And giving birth is by no means a walk in the park. Imagine what that would be like if we kind of transcended our ability, you know, obviously not just talking about um, cesareans and all this kind of thing, but figured out some way where it wasn't so um, painful and physical and it didn't have to come out through such a small birth canal. Um, Will women's hips start to shrink over time? And, you know, these things have just such far reaching effects that I, to your point about feet and space, I don't think um, we can really gauge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it, it's, it's selection pressures. Again, mm-hmm. it, comes down, it comes down to selection pressures. So th- th- this, is, this is one of the things about evolution that I do love. It, it, it is at its heart, it's so simple an idea, right? Yeah. Selection pressures mean that this is going to do well, that's not going to do well, there will be more of this. And, you know, the, um, as you said, the question of um, hips, et cetera, that, of course, comes to things like survival and giving birth and all, and all that. Uh, the things that used to really uh, kill large swathes of population, right? Mm-hmm. We're, we're already changing a lot of that. Yeah, true. Um, and I said, we don't know what our selection pressures are going to be like in, in the future. Uh, so, we, I, I mean, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess of what a typical human will look like in 10,000 <laughs> years' time. It, cause I it, know. You know. Right? It could be just way off the scale from what I, I can imagine now. What do you think is him? Do you have any idea or any hypotheses as to what you think the selection pressures are now? Well, so, so, so selection pressures um, at the moment, they're, they're still very similar, right? Yeah. The thing is, is now is what, what has changed for humans is, um, is the, the societal structure has changed, right? in that we have become uh, a relatively monogamous uh, sort of species. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's no longer, I mean, so, so if you want to ensure that your genes get passed on to uh, future generations, you don't have to kill 20 men before you get the right <laughs> to do that. So, 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 so that side of se- selection pressure has changed, but there's still the entire... Um, the, the other side of the coin, which Darwin also wrote about it, on the, the sexual selection, what makes uh, one person attractive to another and how do those traits go through populations? Mm. Those, of course, are still at play and, uh, and, and we, we try to pretend that they're not, but they still exist there. You know, societies have an idea of what, what is beautiful, what isn't beautiful kind of thing. Um, 
Yeah, it's, look, it's not my area of expertise. I, I mean, I, I think we are still evolving and we are still susceptible to uh, selection pressures, but it's just very different to what it was 100,000 years ago, right? It said it's not the same, um, uh, same battle to pass on your genes to future generations. Yeah, and it's almost not even uh, uh, as important for people as it was. Like you look at people, um, the Japanese, for example, you know, well, and, and just to broaden that out, people are having children much older, you know, and yes. so many people aren't even having children anymore. Yeah. So, so actually that's, you now you mentioned that, of course, that, that is a selection pressure, right? And it's selection, pre- selection pressure. It's a conscious on- selection pressure. <laughs> brought on by career and financial yes. issues, yes. right? Ask, if you asked somebody, you know, 200 years ago, that, you know, if you said to them in 200 years' time, w- women will be waiting till later in life so, to have children so they could establish their career and make enough money, et cetera, they would probably be flabbergasted that that's yeah, the yeah. situation. So, but, so that's at play. And, and what we know, of course, what that's leading to is that uh, there are, ends up with, more and more women are unable to have children because they've left it too late Mm -hmm. and a a larger reliance on um, IVF because of course, fertility drops as you get older Mm. and that's bringing in its own influences, right. On, on, um, on the human population. Mm. So it's, it's a play, but it's just, I said, it is, uh, it's an area which I'm not an expert at, but I, I, I find fascinating. Oh, I, I find it fair. That, that might be an area that you and I might have to have a beer over and just talk shit and, and bro philosophy for, for hours. You know, sound smart, but really we have no idea what we're talking about. We have no idea. There are definitely people out there who have a much better idea than I do. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, great. So um, talk us through this, this, this third book because I, this is something, now that we have the full background and we've caught up um, over the past couple of years, uh, this is something that's on the rise for you now, so... Yes. Okay. So the, the, the book, it, the title is still to, to be finalized. It's with oh, the publisher right now. Right. But it's, it's something like the quantum and the cosmos. Right. Cool. And the idea is, is that we want to get across this notion of there being these two pillars in modern fundamental physics, the quantum mechanical side, the relativ- relativistic side. And what we want to illustrate is that in understanding the life of the universe, you need both. Okay. Mm. So it's like one of those things that uh, wherever we want to talk about a particular aspect of the universe, such as the big bang, the birth of the universe, right? Um, We know that the universe was hot and dense and expanding. And so I can talk about the expansion in terms of Einstein's general theory of relativity. That tells me how a universe expands. But in that expansion, there's this hot soup of matter. And if I want to talk about hot soups of matter, I need quantum mechanics. Mm. So if I want to talk about how the early universe, uh, you know, it came into being and it was 75% hydrogen and 25% helium and a smattering of other stuff. Uh, to do, to m- make that description, I need to w- have relativity and quantum mechanics sort of working together to do that sort of description. And it turns out that all aspects of the life of the universe, even today, the sun, a star, is governed by gravity squeezing inwards and then uh, electromagnetism pushing outwards because that's what the, uh, the light does as it makes its way out to the star, plus then the other forces at work in the, in the heart of the star. So we sort of break the book into three sort of bits, the, you know, the quantum of the universe past, the quantum of the universe present, and what's going to happen into the distant future universe. And again, we're going to have quantum mechanics and relativity play in their parts as the universe ages and, and basically runs down towards the, the heat death of the universe, which is what the, you know, the long-term future ha- has ahead of us. Mm-hmm. So it was trying to get that appreciation that you need both if you want to understand how the universe operates. Yes, absolutely. And so are there some people that, 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 that don't think you need both? Well, the, what often happens is, is that it, it becomes the trade secret, right? If you're in the field, then it's kind of obvious you, you need, so you need to walk along your shelves and grab your quantum mechanics book and you go, grab your relativity book, sit down and need to open both. Right. 
But from outside, you may not realize that that's what you have to do, mm. right? So, you know, the, the, the nuclear physics, right, which comes uh, originally from nuclear weapons and nuclear um, power, that nuclear physics is the same nuclear physics that we use to describe the hearts of stars, right? Mm. So, yes, when you think about it, clearly, yes, I need to talk about nuclear physics, but I also need to talk about gravity because gravity is the thing that squeezes the star. Mm-hmm. So when you think about it, yes, these things do play their parts, but it's not often painted in that kind of way. Because yeah. again, people, when they describe what's going on, they won't say, oh, and that's nuclear physics, and this is gravity. Without, without um, It sort of gets brushed over. So we sort of like, yes. try to make a distinction that these are the two pieces that we need to pull together and... We use them, but at some level, we know that at some level they're in conflict because they don't work together. So we do also mention the places that we cannot solve yet, right? So there's two key places. One is the very birth of the universe. We do not know how a universe comes into being. And we think it's because we can't get gravity and the other forces to to play nicely. Mm -hmm. The other place is the hearts of black holes, the very centers of black holes yeah. in, in, in Einstein's mathematics, they are infinitely dense. And we don't like infinities in our theories. No. <laughs> uh, so, so some people have suggested that maybe quantum mechanics, when you squeeze something so hard, the quantum mechanic comes in like a lone ranger and saves the day. <laughs> but until we get gravity and quantum mechanics to play nicely together, we can't describe that state. So yeah. we s- still have mysteries in the universe that are inaccessible to us. And once they are, right, once we do crack that nut and understand what is at the center of a black hole, understand where the universe comes from, you know, we are going to have great power, right? <laughs> because it, it will. Te- I'm sure, I, I, and this is me speculating more than anything, that we will be able to manipulate things like gravity in a way that we never thought was possible. And if you can wow. manipulate gra- gravity, you can get faster than light travel. Right, yeah, yeah. so you can you can do all kinds of things, it, but have to crack that nut. People have been working at it for a hundred years, and it's you know. But it, I said it could be solved tomorrow. Yeah, that's that's I, right. And a hundred years isn't a whole lot of time if you really think about it it. it. it it isn't. It isn't. And I think I mentioned this last time, right? One of the, the one of the big things that's changing around the world is the education educational opportunities yes. in, in countries. That means that smart people are able to get educated and start yes. contributing to this enterprise we call science. And my dream is, is that some, somewhere around the world, some kid one day is going to have an idea and it's going to change everything. Uh, and, absolutely. You know, and a hundred years ago, that, that person wouldn't, wouldn't have had the opportunity and would have been forgotten to history, right? Just disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you see uh, Interstellar? What do, you, what do you think of that movie? Well, what do I think of Interstellar? I, I <laughs> mix, mixed bag. So right. I look, uh, as a movie, first, we'll start with that question. Then we can talk about the physics. <laughs> all right. So as a movie, I thought it was okay in the sense that the, um, the, the, the environmental aspects, are, I think, are, yeah. are real and facing yeah. us. The solutions uh, was a little bit hand wavy, <laughs> uh, and then then I I have this real problem with um, black holes have become well, what's the right way of putting it? They've become your sort of get out of jail free card in sci fi movies, right? Yeah. So you know, there's a right. few movies that have black holes in them, right? So there's number one is is the black hole from the 1970s. You go through there, you end up in some sort of Dante's hell scene. <laughs> there's the black hole in Event Horizon, the horror movie mm. with Sam Neill. Yes. You go through you go through there and it is really hell. <laughs> you you've got the Event Horizon in the movie Sphere by Michael Crichton. No, I've not I've, seen that. Okay. Haven't you? That's oh, pretty good cool sci-fi. Oh, it, it's, got, it. um, it's got uh, Dustin Hoffman as, oh. and um, Sharon Stone. Oh, wow. Uh, it's sort of, okay. it's sort of, it. It sort of disappeared off the radar a little bit. But again, in there, the, the, the black hole was just a bit, ooh. Yes, and, of course, of course. Then, 
at in, Interstellar, then it's some sort of multi-dimensional. I can write words in dust kind of thing. I know. So, I know. So transcending this, the fourth dimension. Y- yes. Yes. So yeah, look, I, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it either. Yeah. But but one of the important things is that the the Christopher Nolan, that's who it was, who was the yep. director, yep. wanted to get get the black hole to look correct right yes yes and, and so he actually um roped in uh kip thorne who it so got, recently got the nobel prize for gravitational wow. wave detection to actually show them how to calculate what a what a black hole would look like or the Whoa. material swirl around a black hole so they got that part sort of right they didn't like the actual realistic black hole so they removed one or two effects right but they got the overall structure right it's, it's interesting that uh, I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about the physics of this and when Matthew McConaughey is going through the – it's actually my favourite movie. I just want to preface it. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't know as much as you do about the physics, so I can, I can just be stunned by it, you know, in the same way that a magician won't be by a card trick, yeah. you know. Um, but when, when he's going through the, the black hole, like, and his body's twisting and turning, and it from, from what it sounds like, it's the – the, the closer you are to the black hole, uh, the, the, the faster time is and, the, and, and where his head is, the, the slower time is. Is that the way it is? And so, like, you'd be ripped in this weird kind of time. Yeah. Thing? I don't know. Uh, it, well, there's a couple of things that, that go on when you, when you jump into a black hole. I mean, the, the worst part is the tidal forces. The gravity on your feet is just much, much stronger than the gravity on your head. So that stretches you, and there, right. there is this there is this thing called spaghettification, right? Because you get you get drawn out until the the bonds in your atoms and molecules can no longer hold you together, oh, and you God. just you get pulled apart. But there there is then also the the time dilation effect that right. your feet and your head are experiencing different times, and then there's the entire distortion of your view because the light rays are traveling around in strange paths also. So yeah, wow. it, it, would be re- it would be really trippy. But I, I, wow. I said, I, I don't know if you end up in some multidimensional library though. Yes, exactly. Well, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But is, would, would you die faster? Would it be a very painless death? Because I imagine that all that happening at the same time would just kill you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have to remember that um, the signals in your body um, are, uh, you know, the electrical impulses, they're limited by the speed of light, they're limited by all this stuff going on as well. I mean, I wouldn't like to guess how sore you're going to be when you get ripped apart. Um, But I'm sure somebody's calculated that. Uh, It it might be one of those things that going in head first is better than feet first. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh. Wouldn't that be a lovely way to end life in full circle? You've come out head first. You're going to die that way too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so yeah. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm going to ask on Twitter later to see. Yeah, if you should. This. And, I think uh, that'd be interesting. It would be interesting because it's. I just look. You know, I know nothing about this sort of stuff, but I just imagine like if you were getting sucked into a black hole, you'd for that to happen, for that to be happening to you, would kill you faster than you would be able to experience the pain of it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. That's an interesting one. I'd, I'd, have to, I'd have to think about it. You'd have to, I mean, wh- where would you break first? This well, that's a good question. point, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. At what point would you start to go, okay, this is now tearing me up. But if the time dilation and, and I, I, again, I have to say, I don't know anything about this. So everything I say could be wrong here, but I imagine it's after you're getting stretched, like, wouldn't that just kill you? Just to, I just can't imagine, like, it almost sounds like you just disintegrate. Yeah. 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 But there's weird things that can happen, right? Remember the, I said the signals in your body are electromagnetic pulses, right? And you, they, the, you know, they're, they're going through the same thing. What if they are just slowly being fed into your brain so it's just like one long draw? Oh, out? God. <laughs> I don't know. Feeling. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I will ask on Twitter and see what, uh, we'll see what other physicists think. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, I'm gonna follow that uh, trend. <laughs> see, it'll, it'll be a trend, I think, right? That'd be brilliant. Um, that's fantastic. So when's this book coming out anyways? 
Um, oh, it should be l- middle to late next year. So okay, cool. we're, we're just about to deliver the final copy, sort nice. out the title, and then we're done. And is it written for, are your books in general written for the public or they're written for other physicists? Both? Oh, for, for the public. Okay. Uh, both the ones that we've written so far um, and, and this one coming up, they are definitely, you know, the kind of people that would uh, read something like uh, DeGrasse Tyson's Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, right? Yeah. So it, cool. it's, not, it's not the gory math side of things. Even though I love the gory side, math side of things, uh, it's more the, the the bigger picture kind of stuff. How does it all hold together? Yeah, that's brilliant. I think there's a there's a there's a real growing demand for for that area of people that, uh, like you said just before, you know, we have access to information uh, that Eric Weinstein. Do you know Eric Weinstein? I, I know Eric. Yeah, yeah. Eric, I'm not Eric. personally, but yeah, yeah, of course, I, I love Eric Weinstein. He says, you know, we 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 now have the Library of Alexandria in our pocket. You know, yes, and uh, yes. but it's a, but it's a library that's constantly updating itself, which is which is insane to think of. You know, but with this access to information, I think more and more people, I know I certainly am, um, are becoming more interested in these kind of big big questions, like how how do we get here? What am I? You know, like what the hell's going on here? All this sort of stuff. So it's exciting that uh, I've had the, the pleasure of speaking to you for four ta- four times now. I think um, first time was at your house. That was a great house. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, we're not there anymore. So. Oh, you're not there. All oh, right. No, no, no. no. We're, we're currently um, moving up to the Blue Mountains. Oh, I'm, I, I'm really a, a country folk kind of guy, so um, we're going to be building up in the mountains in the next year or so. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, we, we did yeah. the same thing. We, we moved out to uh, Gippsland, down, down oh. to the east in, in Victoria, because we were, uh, yeah, country people too. Uh, excellent. Sounds good. It's so, good. Can I just mentioned one thing quickly, though. Go for it. About having the Library of Alexandria in your pocket, you've also, of course, got the the massive joke uh, joke shop in your pocket as well. Right? In, the, in the sense that you, we have this growing information, yet there seems to be a growing number of people who are anti-vax, flat Earth, and that kind of thing. There's a bit of a bit of yin and yang. Yeah, yeah. This Q and on, yeah, exactly. It is strange that as the amount of information has gone up that not necessarily the scientific knowledge of the population has gone up proportionally and some places has gone backwards. It's, it, you know, that, that is a podcast. If uh, you want to, we could spend hours talking about, I'm writing a book right now that's based on that, but more, more or less the political sphere, you know, why the, why the left and right becomes so polarized um, yeah. you know, I don't want to blame it on one person. I won't do that, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we live in this world now where we can't agree on what's true, you know, because there are an infinite number of ways of interpreting the world. This, this is a, this is a conversation that would be great actually for you and I to get into because we have this subjective lens, you know, and it's, it's so hard for me to say, you know, I might say this is a brilliant podcast. You might say that was the that was the most boring podcast I've ever been on. We were both on the podcast, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but you broaden that out and you get conspiracy theories and, and just growing and growing and growing because we can't escape our, our echo chambers. And you know, you have a look at what social media does with its algorithms recommending what's ever going to give you that that dopamine squirt. It's uh it's a it's a dangerous world. We we have I think a better way of saying that perhaps would be we all have our own library of Alexandria is in our pocket and we get to choose what books that we want to put in there. Uh, yes. Yeah, I know. I know. But, you know, wouldn't it be nice if somebody who was a bit of a secret agent inside Facebook and inside Twitter tweaked the algorithms just so, you know, you've got a little bit more science and fact and truth, et cetera, rather than what, you know, they think you want to hear. Right. Oh, so God, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's a saying, uh, there's a saying in the military that uh, it's not true, right? But, you know, there's the, the saying is that there's no atheists in foxholes. Uh, everyone finds God when somebody's shooting at you. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> right? So, so I, I actually think that, um, you know, anti-science people, once, once you're in the hospital attached to the machine that goes ping, then, you know, science is the... Science is the is the thing that can save you. And I heard a, a stat about Germany, right? There's yeah. a 
so Germany has a very large population of anti-vaxxers, right? Even though they're very scientifically advanced, a very progressive people, they have a large population. And I, I'm trying to remember uh, these, I, I'll quote some numbers, but these are probably wrong. Sure. That, that I think it was like 20% of, of women said that they were not going to get their children immunized, right? Mm. This is what they say. Five, wow. but, uh, but, but when you look at the kids who go to school in Germany, right? It's less than 5% aren't immunized. Mm. So the, the rhetoric and what actually happens do not really match each other. And you have, and I wonder if this is what's being played out, not, not only with vaccinations, but with all, all kinds of things that people have conspiracy theories about. But again, I'm not a big expert in that area, but <laughs> it, it, would, it is something to think about, right? It As is. you said, you know, when, you, when you're hooked up to the machine that goes ping, that's that's what tell me is. tell me what that yeah exactly and yeah. and you know look as well it's conspiracy theories they're, they're theories they're, I, I i would argue that it would be a minority of people that actually take that as true and then live their lives in that way we see it on social media because that's what int- attracts the engagement you know we we have this uh, negativity bias um we're much more you know what what sparks the brain up with energy um more than love is hate and anger, you know, and these, these, these tech companies are just harnessing our, the worst parts about us to, to make this. And I'm not having a big go at tech companies, but um, when you live in a system that's designed for infinite growth, you know, people are going to take that and go, well, how can we keep people addicted? It's like, well, we're going to feed into what keeps them wanting to pay attention to things, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah which is a very dangerous thing. But, uh, you know, to, 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 to your point, um, well, actually not so much to your point. We now live in a world now where there's so much information and people are taking that on themselves and being pragmatists, um, generally speaking, you know, and that's a good thing. It's like, Oh, I read this paleo diet and this guy was talking about how, and this is true, actually, um, this guy, um, never uses sunscreen. Apparently the chemicals in sunscreen are terrible. He spent eight hours in Yosemite and um, didn't get sunburned. doesn't get sunburned anymore. And he says it's all due to the fact that uh, oil, the amount of oil that we take, canola oil, sunflower oil is toxic for the body. And since he's taken out all the oils, he no longer gets sunburned. Now that's a very crazy idea to people that have grown up think, you know, knowing that sunscreen um, has really helped them, you know, prevent them from, from getting sunburned, but just have a think about what used to be crazy ideas. Women in politics used to be a crazy idea. Women were too oh, yeah. emotional, they were too emotional, you know, they weren't rational. And, and now look at it, you know, we need more of them in there. Don't want to play the identity politics game, but having that diversity of um, ideas is what I should say. Um, but, uh, you know, those ideas that were crazy no longer are. So I think what, I, what I'm really interested in now, um, just, you know, bringing that back to the, my final point is, is, is listening to each other because there, we, we all have something potentially that, that, that we can learn from, you know, and the sunscreen guy to us sounds, sounds crazy, but if he's not getting burnt, that's something that I also want to be a part of. So maybe the anti-vaxxers are something like, maybe some of the more, uh, the less polarizing anti-vaxxers saying, hey, look, that is working now, but some of this biohacking stuff and these anti-inflammatory diets and, you know, these natural things are, are also helping. So let's kind of play around with both ideas. But that, uh, I, I agree. Look, and as a scientist, I'm open to ideas and look, the, the sunscreen dude could be right. Yeah. The, the anti-vaxxer diet could be right, but there's a process, right? There's a exactly. scientific pro- process for assessing what works and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're, if you're willing to play by those rules, then fine. Right. And I, I, but the, the process, the process of testing these things and how you test them is established and we should follow those rules. So, yes. Uh, but look, is, much- is there politics in science though? Great. This is, this is, this is a question. Uh, should, should, pro- should certain experiments and programs be funded more than they perhaps are? Because a majority of scientists think that they're kind of crazy or I, mean, I don't know. So, Well, the, the, politics is not the right word 
right? That's, so look, what does a scientist want to do, right? A, a scientist wants to do science. And what that means is you want to have a hypothesis, you want to test it, and you want it, uh, if you want it either not to work or to work, right? So if you come along and say, say said to me, oh, if you leave out oils, you don't get sunburned. Mm-hmm. And I said, what's the evidence? And you say, oh, there's this guy on YouTube. Look, he's been up to Yosemite. <laughs> yeah. I sort of go, well, well, I haven't really got time to, to really test that. Right. Now, if you come, come back and said, oh, actually, no, now there's this big group of people. And I go, oh, so there's a, there's a group there. And I think to myself, well, maybe I can test that. That's when it starts to work. So, right. you know, so, so the, 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 the plural of anecdote is not data. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Anecdote is a starting point, but it has to be a pretty good starting point. So, it's so true. The, so, the, so the, there is politics. We have to remember what the goal of the scientist is, is to test hypotheses. And if, if, it's, if it's ropey to start with, then you're not going to get much traction. It's the same as the crazy cosmological idea. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that scientists are completely closed to ideas. They've just got to have some sort of kickoff point that makes it worthwhile testing them. Because otherwise, we could be testing everything, right? Because you could come along and say, actually, actually, you don't need to leave out oils. You, all you've got to do is eat blue Smarties. <laughs> now, that is something that we should yeah. test. <laughs> now, there's another hypothesis we have to test. And there's, only, <laughs> and there's only so many hours in the day, and there's only so much money in science. Yes. And yes, testing blue hy- uh, blue smarties is important but then again so is leukemia right, right? exactly and right. So, so so it's resources etc so yes as i said it it's there there is politics at a level but it's pragmatic politics it's, it's true and i don't see many now i haven't gone too far down that rabbit hole but i don't see too many anti-vaxxers putting forward solutions there seems a lot of just no 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 this is wrong this is wrong this is bad there's no This is why, because I've tested this and it's been working really well. I've been eating a whole lot of kale and you know what? I just, I, I, I I haven't had any kind of illness, you know, I feel really good. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But you know, the world's, one of the world's oldest women smoked and chilled till she was 115. Now, would you suggest to people to take up smoking based on one case? No, you wouldn't. I probably wouldn't. (laughs) Yeah. Well, but, but I saw this look as an example. So the queen's sister, Mm-hmm. Princess Margaret, mm-hmm. she died, I don't know, 15 years ago or something now, and she was a smoker and she was a drinker. And somebody said to me, uh, so th- there you go. There's the sign that you shouldn't smoke and drink. The queen's mother was a gin and tonic drinker until she died and she was 104 or something. Yeah. You, you can't take anecdote and turn it into evidence. You need to it's have true. samples and work on it. Mm. So, so, yes, uh, look, if you want to test more, then just get your government to put more money into science and more science will be tested. Yes. But you have to be willing to play by the rules. It's right? so true. It's so true. And, and, and yeah, exactly right. And, uh, you know, I, I love the people that have come forward as individuals and, and put their own theories through the rigor and come out on top. One thing that I, you know, one example that I love is Freud's theory of the unconscious. You know, people hated that because, you know, psychology, uh, you know, Freud, Freud wanted psychology to be a, a science, a science of the mind, you know, and people before that were, were very interested in, um, the biology and what we could see and what, why, why this would affect, you know, that the brain is a computer. And when you press this button, it makes person A do this. This is why we are the way we are. But Freud's theory of the unconscious was so, um, so heavily critiqued because there, it, it, drew on that subjectivity and dreams and trauma coming from the, you know, that was difficult to, and now we can actually measure that kind of stuff, you know, with what's going on with um, neuroscience, MRI scans, what goes on with the amygdala, all that kind of stuff. Another example is Wim Hof. Do you know Wim Hof? Oh, your internet has just slowed down. Oh, can you hear me, Grant? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. You you just slowed you you zoned out for a second there. I zoned out. So, Sorry, mate. I got to be yeah. Daisy. <laughs> yeah. Not a good feeling. Uh, there. So it's, yeah. So you you said had I heard of and you said a name. Yes, Wim Hof. No, no. Wim Wim Hof is a guy who um, went through a tough um, a tough experience in life. I, I believe his wife 
committed suicide. And um, I think that's right. And uh, he had this experience in cold water and it immediately um, flushed his immune system. And um, can you hear it clicking, correct? No, I can't, oh, but okay. you're slowing down again. Oh, which is it? I can hear a clicking. This might this might be uh, time for us to uh, call it, but I'll I'll um, I'll finish <laughs> it off by by talking about women. He has now shown that cold exposure can um, can help so much with an immune system that a scientist injected him with the flu essentially, and by him being in an ice bath, uh, he was able to remove that flu in a, in, a, in about four hours, or I think it was even less or something. So those those um, those outliers, you know, doesn't have to necessarily be a group of people. It can be those outliers that are so sure of their theories can actually change the way we see ourselves. That, that's right. But, but you do have to test this all scientifically, right? Yes. Just, be, just because somebody is a bit out there, right? You, you know, the, the, I hear the story of the maverick all the time, right? Mm -hmm. they, the idea that the maverick is the one that you need to change something. And they say, so they laughed at Einstein, right? But they also <laughs> yeah. laughed at Coco the Clown, right? You, you know, just because <laughs> someone's a maverick doesn't make them right. True. That, as again, scientists, it's the same. A scientist needs an open mind, but not so open that their mind falls out, oh, yes. right? So you do have to approach things from the scientific method, and you do have to approach things and test them. And that's what we do. That's what we do. Yes. But you do need something to test. It's so true. Uh, that just made me think of um, the uh, what, what the what the Christians say about Hitler. You know, they say, "Oh, well, Hitler was an atheist." You know, we also had a moustache. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And he ate bread. And he ate bread. <laughs> yeah. So exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah, it, it's um, it's a more complicated picture, but I, I think it's. Look, science is the best bullshit detector we've got. Mm. And, and as you said, it's got us to where we are. And we, we are still, you know, making uh, discoveries every single day. Mm. Uh, I, you know, I just, I just hope for a day where science is more appreciated in society oh, God, and, and, and by governments. Um, but, yeah. you know, ho hopefully in the future. Hopefully in the future, when we take a step back and realize what the wonderful kind of stuff it's brought us with microphones and headphones and friends online. Great. Thank you so much for coming on for round two, mate. Absolutely. And more than happy to get together and chat again in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I'd love to do another show when your uh, book comes out. You can just send me an email or something. I'll probably see it because I follow you and all that sort of thing. So, All right. All right. Sounds good. Uh, more than happy to come back on and chat. Brilliant. Guys, thanks so much for listening. See you next week. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. If you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.